Jesus is Lord. And he was such a nice Jewish boy. Jesus changed my life. And he's still in the life-changing business. As Paul said, the love of Christ compels. You know, Randy, I think most people don't realize how much darkness there is in it, the world. It can't be just coming to church and getting pumped up with the you faith. And I are all going to have to have something of faith in us. Jesus which we died see. to save sinners, and you are a sinner. Shalom and welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Randy Weiss. I'm a Jewish believer in a Jewish Messiah, and I believe in this Jewish book. I want to read you the words from uh, a Jewish king, uh, King Solomon, in Psalm 127. Uh, his words say, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wakes, but in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Uh, a lot of things people do ends up kind of being cast aside. It's unfortunate when folks pursue their own goals in their own way, things sometimes don't work. And I think it's even worse when they do work, but they don't work in a manner that honors the Lord, and then they end up sadly being the director of their own steps. Uh, I appreciate you being here to uh, watch our program, Crosstalk. Some of you have followed this program since the early 1990s. Some of you are new to our audience. But what probably most of you don't know is how Crosstalk came to be. And um, before this iteration of our ministry in television, uh, I had been in ministry for about 20 years before we actually went into a weekly television program. And there was a period of time where I pulled myself out of public ministry because I had kind of reached the conclusion that I really wanted to minister to the Lord more than I wanted to minister to people. I don't know if you know what that means, but I just reached a place where I said, I want to just spend more time telling God how much I love Him, trying to getting to, to, to know Him better and more intimately. And People can sometimes get in the way of a minister ministering to the Lord. And maybe that sounds weird, I don't know. But uh, an odd thing happened in, in my situation. Uh, one day at church, uh, uh, a pastor at the church got up in front of the congregation and said, uh, uh, next week, Sunday, is Friends Day. We want everybody to invite a friend to church. Perhaps some of you came to church and uh, you were uh, invited by someone to a church on a friend's day, so you know what that looks like. But I had reached a place where I was spending all my time studying the scriptures, and, and I was involved in different Bible colleges and seminaries, and so many of my friends were Christians and loved the Lord, and we would talk about theology and the things of God, and my time was focused on getting to know God better. And even after 20 years in ministry, I think people can have that desire. I hope they can maintain that desire, but an odd thing happened. I recognized that when this pastor had said, bring an unsaved friend to church, and he was specific, bring an unsaved friend to church on Friend Day, I realized my life had been so altered and I was spending so much time with people who were Christians and in ministry in different capacities, I realized I really didn't hardly know any unsaved people anymore and it was distressing. I didn't know what to do. 
So I like to do my Bible study in coffee shops. So sometimes there's waitresses there who don't know the Lord. So I invited the waitresses who uh, I took to be unbelievers to come to church. But I was very dissatisfied. That was un that was not sufficient. And I became uh, anxious, just very anxious because God's love is so precious and so deserving of being expressed and so important to share with others. And I realized that this season of my life was so involved with people who love the Lord and declare his love that I had to do something different to go back to telling people who didn't know the Lord about his love. And uh, you might find this odd, but uh, I heard they were um, bringing on phone counselors for a ministry. And so I went to where they were interviewing people and I said, can I uh, be a phone counselor? Can I come and talk to people about God? And they said, yeah, fill out this application and uh, come back for an interview. And I said, well, I, I just want to talk to people about God on the phone. And they said, uh, fill out this application and come back tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening uh, for an interview. And I, and, and I said, but no, you don't understand. I just want to talk to people about God. They said, fill out this application and we're hiring people for being phone counselors. And I says, I, I don't want a job. I just want to talk to people about God. So they said, fill this application out. And so I said, well, I'll have to talk to my wife. So I took the application and I, I went home and I just, I didn't have it in my heart that I could even tell my wife what I was thinking. I didn't know what to say. So um, I'm going to tell you something here that I think you need to understand. Be very careful how you pray. I, uh, my habit uh, was to get up very early in the morning and go pray. And then when I was done praying, I would go study the scriptures. So at morning prayer the next morning, I made the mistake of praying in a very different way. And I don't know if you've ever prayed this way, but I'm going to warn you, be careful about praying this way. At the close of my time of prayer, I just looked up to God and I said, God, oh God, do whatever you want. Break into my life. But I want to tell people about you. I left morning prayer. I went to the coffee shop. I did my Bible study. I came home and there was a message on my fax machine from a very dear friend. Uh, his name was Harley Coulterman. And Harley Coulterman worked very closely with Dr. Lester Summerall and the Summerall family. Now, some years prior, I had told my friend Harley that uh, I had some television equipment, some production equipment. Uh, we used to do some music videos and uh, I had told him that I had just packed this stuff up and put it in a closet and uh, I didn't even know how to turn the stuff on. But I said, if you ever come across anybody that's interested in this, just please let me know because it's just in a closet. Some years had gone by and the oddest thing occurred. I said that what should have been a very terrifying prayer. So before you ever just open yourself up to God and say, God, do whatever you want, break into my life, be very, very serious about that because God waited till that point. And I got home from prayer and study and the fax machine had a note in my house and it was from Harley and it said, uh, Randy, you still have that stuff? The Summerall's would like to 
use that stuff and they would like to give you a television program. Hence, crosstalk. And in just a brief moment, right after we come back, I want to introduce you to Harley Coulterman, my dear brother, who I blame for all of this. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus shares a parable about sowing seed on good ground where it can produce crop that can yield 30, 60, and even 100 times the amount that was sown. As stewards of what God entrusts us with, we're responsible to sow into good ground that produces a good crop. In the business world, we call this a good ROI, or return on investment. I want to ask you to prayerfully consider making a good investment into the ministry outreach of Crosstalk International. The ROI is evidence that the Lord is doing some great things through this ministry. Several years back, our supporters made it possible for us to build a brand new leprosy clinic in the heart of Orissa, India. Every single month, Crosstalk provides all of the food and medicine that is needed for that ongoing clinic serving dozens of leper patients. Last year, we took on the responsibility to provide food and housing for the children of those leper patients in an effort to help stop the ongoing spread of leprosy to their children. We have 20 different native missionaries that are on the ground throughout the 1040 window, speaking the language of their people and evangelizing the lost as their full-time occupation. Many of them have already planted churches and are moving on to plant new churches, but we're needing support. Our annual missions budget is only reached through the generosity of our supporters. Right now, we need to raise $11,000 for our leprosy outreach, $7,200 for our native missionaries, $8,600 for our Cuba outreach, and we need to raise money to complete the production of the next series of Today with God featuring the Gospel of Luke. Your generous monthly support or one-time gift, it will sow vital seeds on good ground and reap a fruitful harvest. Thank you for your consideration to invest in the ministry outreach of Crosstalk International. All checks and gifts should be made payable to Crosstalk Missions. I can assure you that the ROI of your investment will be one that the Lord is happy with. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. When God does something, He knows what He's doing. And I am grateful that uh, He's doing something. And my brother, Harley Coulterman, it's so good to see you. And I do hold you responsible for this. You and the Lord. <laughs> oh, it's really great to be with you, Randy. Uh, it's been a lot of years that we've uh, known each other. Yep. Uh, since my sister introduced us to, together those years ago, and um, it's been a fantastic—it's uh, been fantastic, really, to see how the Lord has built that relationship. You know, I probably—I mean, this some of what you're saying this morning is probably the first time I heard kind of the capsule of the story, <laughs> but I had uh, really no idea that this is what happened out of that facts or phone calls that followed it. But uh, God is amazing, and I love that scripture yeah. because it's the truth. <laughs> if God doesn't build the house, we're finished before we start. Yeah, or it's even worse, and we're successful on our own. <laughs> and that leads to pride and arrogance yeah. and bad things. And, and instead of God building something that's His, it's man building something that really God doesn't really want to have much to do with. Yeah, I guess we've seen a few cases like that, yes. Yeah. yeah you know, you, you mentioned your sister. Um, I am grateful to you and your family because your sister and your brother-in-law, uh, Bob and Gloria, uh, they taught my children. Yes, and, and, they uh, did. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, our, uh, our lives have been intertwined for a long, long time, and God has been faithful. Yeah. Uh, you're pastoring these days in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I would love for you to share with our audience about, uh, first, the pastoral work that you do, because it's my opinion that, you know, Christian television is wonderful. I, I love media outreach, but a lot of people are confused, in my opinion. Uh, God works through the local church. Media is media, but it's the local church where where families are touched and changed and lives are built and, and God works through the ordained local church. That's His methodology. Yes. Yeah, I love Christian television too. I mean, when we got saved, uh, a lot of our feeding came from Christian television. I can remember when Marilyn Hickey and um, 
uh, several others were doing like 15 minute programs. I don't think that's ever heard, of, I don't think that's heard of anymore. But we could watch those 15 minute segments before we went to work and there would be, they'd do them back to back even uh, sometimes. And uh, we kind of cut our t teeth on the faith message and just, uh, you know, things that God was sharing through these brothers and sisters on television. So I'm really, really, really grateful for Christian television. But, you know, I guess the reality is, is you can love Christian television, but that brother or sister who's on the program is probably not going to come to the hospital and pray for you. That's right. Uh, probably not going to visit you when your kids are in trouble. Uh, or when you're feeling down and discouraged and um, you know, much as we could hope that they care and are praying for you in some kind of general way uh, and maybe even have a prayer line, uh, there is a place for the local church and um, uh, the question is how should that look? I mean, that's the bigger question really. Yeah, and in, in your capacity as a pastor in a local church, how do you envision Christianity being done? How do we do church right? The reality is, I think we'll be judged by the book and we should go back to the book to find out what is church. And I guess you discover pretty quickly it's not a location and it's not a building and it's not an organization and it's not a lot of things that maybe people consider to be church, but it really is the people. It's the called out ones is the church. And when you look at church that way, uh, then it can give you a different perspective of maybe how what we call church could be done. And um, I guess what really kind of stuck in my spirit from those years that we kind of began this journey is that somehow we needed to do what Jesus said to do and leave the, leave the rest not done, or at least to try to untangle ourselves from those kind of things. And it's been kind of a journey in doing that. And we're supposed to make disciples with in, in real bona fide church work, in a way people come, they're taught and trained and then sent out. And they're equipped to carry this message of what changed your life yeah. and my life and their life. Right. They then share that message with others so the lives continue to be changed. Yeah, but that's a little messy. You yeah. Know? It's kind of like doing life together. You know, we did some pretty radical things and we got saved, probably both of us. I, I don't yeah. know that we would have been at the top of the church list people, you know. <laughs> for, for one thing, we didn't look like church people too much That's at, right. in those days. That's didn't dress like them either. And uh, so I imagine we were kind of a challenge for the leadership that, uh, uh, to whose care we were entrusted. The, the Jesus Freak era, um, the Jesus Revival, that took place in, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, it was messy. Mm -hmm. It was weird. Uh, God was moving among His people and He was having His way. People were being changed. We were changed. But the concept of the church has not been radically altered. God still wants to the call is the same, to go out and make right. disciples. Yeah, absolutely. It's not to build big buildings, although I don't have a problem with big buildings. It's not to have, you know, mega churches. I don't think, although I don't care if people have mega churches, that's fine, as long as disciples are being made, as long right. as sinners are called to salvation. And it's not changed into something less than a radical change in individual lives. God, right. God doesn't want us to stay the same when He comes to get us. Well, success is kind of relative, but it uh, depends on what you look at as success. But what Jesus said with success is if we fulfilled His commission, and that was to make disciples. And uh, any time that you, any time that I think about discipleship, I, I think about relationship. And usually relationships are a little bumpy and sometimes pretty messy. You know, whether it's relationship in your family or relationship at your workplace or relationships at your church, uh, it becomes really apparent that it's pretty difficult, like for instance in church, to have a relationship with the back of somebody's head. But really that's mostly what you see of the person <laughs> uh, for some minutes during a week time meeting. and. Um, 
it's not really kind of doing life together. It's just kind of meeting together on that weekly basis. And so I think there's a lot to be said for developing relationships that are meaningful, having some accountability, um, developing a uh, some kind of transformational kind of thing that actually changes lives. Uh, obviously through the power of the Holy Spirit, we, I can't transform anybody. I've tried a lot of times and it hasn't worked very well. That just frustrates everybody in the process, doesn't right. it? Right. So, and along the way, you know, you just kind of learn, I guess, how to have some relationships that are meaningful. And um, it just becomes apparent that maybe it's a lot more important what happens outside of the meeting setting than what happens inside. Now, you know that uh, several of my children are involved in local church ministry, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to have to take a break. But when we come back, I would like you to issue some some words of wisdom to young pastors who are struggling with what it takes to be effective in the local church. And I, I think that there's probably a lot of pastors who will be blessed and benefited by the information that you will share. Welcome back to Crosstalk. We're here with my brother Harley Coulterman and uh, uh, I know my kids could use some advice and I would rather it come from you than me. <laughs> well, I think that's maybe the case with all of us. You know, it's a little easier to talk to somebody else's kids. <laughs> and I don't feel like I'm the expert on the subject, but you know, one of the, thing, one of the obvious things is, is number one, let's go back to the Word of God yeah. uh, because that's got to be the basis and if that's not the basis, then you maybe have to ask, why are you doing what you're doing if you're a pastor? Uh, secondly, I think you have to have in your heart that this is, uh, this is not um, something to try. If you're called to be a pastor, you better decide, I'm not going to quit. <laughs> and if you have that in your heart and you really love people and you care about people, uh, reaching them in a way that they can understand, a uh, relational way, is difficult, especially as the numbers begin to uh, add up. Uh, but it's not impossible if you can reproduce yourself in some other folks that will help you and have the same spirit of reaching people with the gospel and ministering to them. Training leaders right. to be able to do ministry. Yes, absolutely. Um, Another thing I think that just comes to mind really quickly is that um, you really can't disciple someone who's not been one. And 
point you know, is that the truth or what? You know, a lot of times we're trying to do that. You know, we just, you know, we've got this house full of people and uh, somehow we got to minister to everybody. Uh, and somehow we, we hope that the classes and all of those other things have gotten through. But many times people have not really been won to Jesus. They've not really surrendered to him. And so you got a tough job if you're going to disciple a person who hasn't really come to Jesus. And people may have said a sinner's prayer. They may have, uh, you know, walked the aisles. They may have done things. They've been baptized, confirmed, and other things that happen in church settings. And they may be convinced, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Christ. But if some transformation hasn't taken in the heart, and if there's no hunger, uh, it's really, really a tough thing to make a disciple of somebody like that. Jesus had some of those problems too, though, so yes, it's he, okay. Yes, he did. Well, Pastor Harley, um, I would like to invite you to come to the next program because I want okay. to talk about changing the world, and you're involved in that, and we share some of the same vision for going out into the world. Uh, but before we close, I do want to tell you that uh, uh, what my brother said in a real nice way is there's a lot of people who darken the doors of a church, but they may not be Christian. They may not be saved, using a Christianese term. I know when I came to faith, uh, I had real long hair and a real long beard. And uh, I remember uh, uh, the day I got saved, I asked the pastor at this little church who I'd never visited before, I said, uh, do I need to cut my hair? And he looked at me and he laughed and he said, uh, well, it's sort of like this, son. He says, Jesus needs to catch him before he skins him. And uh, that sort of stuck with me. Uh, I did cut my hair and I did cut my beard and I don't do the things I used to do. But you know, that's kind of the mark of a Christian. We don't oftentimes, we're not supposed to do some of the things that we used to do that were inappropriate. If you're in church and you're still doing the things that are inappropriate, you should ask yourself uh, what the disconnect is. Are you living in sin if you happen to be living in sin because you're walking in disobedience? Or are you just simply not saved? There's a difference. Uh, and it ain't for me to tell you, but I would suggest you might wanna look deep, ask God, and then do what the Lord shows you. I appreciate you joining us here in this program at Crosstalk. I hope you'll come back next time because we're going to talk about some extremely exciting things that are happening in the world. God is revealing Himself to a lost dying world. Till then, Shalom and God bless.